So up next, we have Dr. Gerardo Lopez Mena. Um, Dr. Lopez Mena grew up in a predominantly Hispanic community in El Monte, California. He graduated from Pomona College in Claremont, California, and received his medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, located in Bronx, New York. He completed internal medicine residency training at John Hopkins Bayview Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. And this is where he founded Embajadores de Salud de la Comunidad, um, a program that aims to educate the Hispanic community about important health topics. He has served as the chair of the National Hispanic Medical Association's Council of Residents and also served as a member of that governing board. Dr. Lopez Mena began his tenure at DHR Health as a physician executive of community engagement and has led the growth of the hospitalist program. He is now the vice president of medical affairs and part of the Renaissance Hospitalist Group. Let's welcome Dr. Mena. Thank you very much. Man, that guy looks a lot younger than I look now, right? That was eight, almost eight years ago. So if you want to go into medicine, think, think about that, okay? I'm just kidding. Medicine is awesome. This is part of the reason why I came down in the valley. I'm not from the valley, born and raised in LA, like the biography says. But <laughs> doing a lot of the work that I was doing, you start reading about a lot of the illnesses that specifically affect the valley, right? And to me, my parents are Mexican, uh, Mexican-American. Um, it really, I, I'm proud to, to be part of an institution that focuses on our health, okay? What I'm gonna talk about today, they said, can you talk about cancer in 20 minutes? Can't really talk about cancer in 20 minutes, right? But there are a couple points that I want you to pay attention to, and I'm going to make them all very clear, okay? Because you guys can be the difference between your family member being healthy and fighting and curing a cancer versus a family member passing away from a cancer, okay? <laughs> so cancer is a growing epidemic. A lot of us became familiar with the word pandemic, epidemic, right? Pandemic is a worldwide illness, right? Epidemic is more regional, right? <laughs> with COVID, we were exposed to a pandemic crisis that scared all of us, right? Unfortunately, there's something more scarier, right? Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in the United States of America and worldwide. Cancer is number two in the United States of America and worldwide. So if you pay attention again, you will find that you can help your family members. <laughs> what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with clinical vignettes. And what clinical vignettes are examples of cases that we learn from as medical students, as residents, as doctors. So just like we learn from them, I want you to learn from them, okay? Number two, we'll talk about some key numbers. We'll then talk about a major concept that I want you guys to go home with, and that's prevention. Screening and prevention. And lastly, I'll give you a little blurb about our center and what we do. So a disclaimer, I'm a hospitalist, internal medicine doctor. Okay, I'm not an oncologist, but just like I can work on this, you guys can learn all this stuff as well and take it home, okay? So the first clinical vignette, I want you guys to participate, okay? 63-year-old male presents to the primary care doctor for regular checkup. Blood work shows anemia. Colonoscopy three years ago was normal. What would you like to order? So let's break down the vignette, okay? First and foremost, primary care doctor. Are we all familiar with what a primary care doctor does? Yes? Great. Blood work shows anemia. Who knows what anemia is? Yell it out. Yell it out. We're going to make this fun. What's that? Yes, okay, so lack of iron can cause anemia, that's correct. It's one type of anemia. But anemia is when your blood levels come down, right? And that's not normal. Anytime that happens, you have to check it out. You gotta work it up, okay? So what would you like to order? Okay, I, you, that's a good, that's a good uh, suggestion, recommendation. You wanna check that, the, that this test is real and it wasn't a mistake, let's order it again. What next? He had a colonoscopy that was done three years ago. Colonoscopy is when they take a camera, right, and they go through your anus, and they go through your intestines, right, to look for cancer or any other illness, right? So he had a normal colonoscopy three years ago. Do you guys want to order another one? That's correct, right? First, you want to order what's called an FOBT, which is a study to look at if there's any blood in a fecal or cold blood test, okay? 
If that's positive, you want to get another one. This, this patient here is my father. You know, I was lucky that the primary care doctor said, you know what, I don't like this anemia. I know you had a normal colonoscopy three years ago. Your FOBT was positive. I want you to get another colonoscopy. Luckily, my dad got it in time. He was saved. 31-year-old female with no significant past medical history who presents two months with two months of palpitation, sweating, increased bowel movements, rapid weight loss. On physical exam, patient is known to have thinning skin. And again, I'm going to drive home two concepts that I want you guys to, to go home with from these vignettes, okay? What would you like to ask her? Diet's a good question, definitely. Definitely need to ask her about her diet. Drugs? Good question, definitely. One of the most important things that you can ask a patient is you get their family history of cancer, okay? That's one of the concepts that I wanna drive home from this clinical vignette. Every one of us has a history of cancer in our family. If you're like my family though, this happens to be my sister, okay? If you're like my family, unfortunately, cancer is one of those things that sometimes is taboo to talk about. It's scary. People look at it from a fatalistic standpoint. They think it's a death sentence. And there's good reason, and we'll talk a little bit about it in a little bit, right? But the point I wanna make here are two, a family history. All of you guys need to go home and do a family history. When I asked my mom, she couldn't tell me. Back in the day, I think people were so scared of cancer that they didn't really talk about it. And that's, that can be hurtful, right, if we don't know what we're looking for. So you use your family history to guide what screenings you should be doing for you and yourself and your family, okay? The second concept that I wanna drive home is our warning signs, right? Symptoms are signs that are telling you there might be cancer. And we'll talk a little bit more about symptoms later, but those two things I want you to go home with to a family history so that you can know what you should test yourself for in the future. And number two is look for the signs and always take signs serious. All right, so why is cancer so scary? Like we talked about, it's the second leading cause of death in the United States and worldwide. Plenty of reason to be fearful, right? There are a hundred different types of cancer. And it's not really infinity, but you can get cancer almost in any part of your body, from your blood, to your organs, to your muscles, to your ligaments, to your bones, almost any part of your body, okay? I put this campfire picture because I wanted to make a point that people are very scared to talk about cancer, right? It's kind of like a campfire story. People are always telling scary stories. You see the, you see the connection? All right, what is the truth? What is the truth? And again, we can spend a lot of time talking about cancer. So I'm simplifying so that we can take home some of these messages. So cancer has been recognized as an illness for thousands of years, right? And the reason why family histories are so difficult is because people don't talk about them. But it's good to know that over the last century, there has been so many advances in how we find cancer, how we look for specific cells to treat, and you guys have been hearing some of that cool stuff, right, to some of the treatments, all right? And that's very important to know. You have to be comfortable talking about cancer, unfortunately. It's scary. It was scary when my sister got her diagnosis. I was 14 years old, I think. I still remember it. My whole family was around. It's scary but you guys can save lives, okay? That's important. So remarkable advances have happened in diagnosing, in treatment, right, and in prevention. All key points that I want you to go home with, okay? Unfortunately, not everything I'm gonna say today is good news. Cancer rates are gonna go up. And the reason why cancer rates are gonna go up over the next few years is because we have an increasing age and because we have what you guys already learned about today, an obesity epidemic. Glucose really feeds cancers significantly, which is why we always have to pay attention to our BMI, okay? 
We talked a little bit about the fear and fatalistic view of cancer and why that makes it very difficult to talk about, okay? But people need to know that they can take steps to reduce their risks. First, start with the family history. Find out what cancers exist in your family. Then you can read about what are the different screening that, are, that exist to try to find these cancers, right? You can go online, and I'm, sure, I'm gonna share some of those sites in a little bit, but the important point is that you take that family history to guide you, and then you can look up that specific cancer and when, at what age, you should start being screened, okay? And as always with cancer, the treatment, the earlier the treatment begins, the higher the likelihood of cure, right? Metastasis, who's familiar with that term? Okay, what metastasis is, is when a cancer gets to a point where it reaches another part of your body. When that happens, it becomes way more difficult to cure. So that's why, again, prevention is very important, okay guys? So knowledge itself is power. Sir Francis Bacon said this. Very important that you guys know that you guys, like I said, I've said it 10 times and I'm gonna say it 10 more times. You guys can save lives, okay? So that knowledge, okay? I want you guys to learn the definition of cancer because cancer is on a spectrum, okay? There's different types of cancers, right? But to get to a cancer, the whole definition has to be met. I'll read it one time. We'll talk a little bit about how, what healthy cells look like, and then we'll come back to the definition. So the definition says it's characterized by uncontrolled growth and spread of abnormal cells that have the potential to invade and destroy normal body tissue. That's the definition of cancer. And like I said, every word has to be met for it to be a cancer diagnosis. So normal healthy cells, this is what happens throughout our lives Every cell is programmed to die, okay? And every healthy individual, okay, you have duplication and replication of cells and division of cells. I don't want you to learn this. I'm probably giving some people flashbacks from biology. I don't want to do that, okay? But the point I want you guys to see is that the body normally replicates and it divides the cells, okay? That's the normal healthy individual. Unfortunately, when we hit cancer, that, that replication of cells is uncontrolled now. Not only is it uncontrolled, but it has the potential to invade other cells and other parts of the body, okay? That's the definition of cancer. Again, don't wanna give anyone any flashbacks, but as you can see, normal cells look different than cancer cells. And the reason I'm showing you this is not to scare you that there's gonna be a quiz or anything like that. It's to show you that there are warning signs that we can look for, right? This is what we eventually see when the, when the tumor gets big enough that you know, we, we can palpate it with an exam or we can see it on a CT scan. And it's when it gets to that point that cancer becomes very dangerous. Benjamin Franklin once said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that can't be more true in today's world with cancer, okay? Again, not gonna test you on what these cells look like, but this is the opportunity that we have. Before we get to cancerous cells, we have dysplastic and hyperplastic cells, right? We can identify those things. Before a cancer become, reaches the potential of invading other parts of your body, all right? So that's what I want you to walk away with. I want you to remember this picture because it shows you that there's an opportunity, right? There's also an opportunity in preventing cancer by looking out for symptoms. And this is a very, very large list. I'm not gonna have you memorize it, but you can memorize this, caution, right? So all these things, are symptoms that can be potential cancer in your body. Caution stands for change in bowel or bladder habits, and that can lead to, you can have colorectal cancer, or you can have bladder cancer, okay? A sore that's, that does not heal, and that could be on your skin, skin cancer. Unusual bleedings or discharge, cervical cancer. Thickening or lump in breast or other regions of one's body, breast cancer. 
indigestion or difficulty swallowing, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, okay? Obvious change in an old wart or mole, skin cancer. Nagging cough or hoarseness in one's voice, lung cancer. Caution is a good word to remember. Anytime anyone has these symptoms that are nagging and don't go away, don't ignore them. There's got to be a workup. At the end of the day, we want to rule out anything that's dangerous. That's my job as a doctor that works in the hospital, right? It's not to cure everything, but it's to eliminate anything that can kill you, right? So we'll talk a little bit about breast cancer, a little bit about colorectal cancer, and a little bit about cervical cancer. What I want you to walk away with, again, is that there are certain ages based on the risk of your family history that you should start screening yourself, okay? So very important, like we talked about before, you go home, you do a family history, and you let that guide you, okay? Breast cancer, as you can see, is one of the cancers that we're affected by the most. Luckily for us in South Texas, we don't have higher rates than the rest of Texas or the United States non-Hispanic white individuals and black individuals have more of a predisposition genetically to develop breast cancer, all right? That doesn't mean we're Hispanic or Latinos are less likely. We still have to you know, do our screenings and, and look out for it, self-exams, all that good stuff, okay? This one I am concerned about a lot. As you can see, cervical cancer, the rates in South Texas are worse than the rates in Texas and the US. So just like all cancers, depending on the risks, cervical cancer, HPV, huge risk factor. There's an HPV vaccine. Everyone needs to get the HPV vaccine. Unfortunately, vaccines have been politicized, right? I'm a doctor. I don't have a political party. I take care of human beings, okay? And vaccinations are one of the strongest tools that we have in our repertoire. You're not gonna find something better, maybe antibiotics, and now chemotherapy and radiation and these precision medicines, right? But vaccinations have really changed the landscape of health, and people have to get them. HPV is a great opportunity, okay guys? Let's get that vaccine. Colorectal cancer, so a little bit different. As you can see the numbers, colorectal cancer is less in South Texas than cerv like, as opposed to cervical cancer where you have higher numbers. So colorectal cancer, what you have to do again is do that family history because depending at the age that your family member was diagnosed with, with colorectal cancer, that will dictate when you should start screening yourself. Okay? And the... the the goal of this slide, the objective of this, sli of this slide is not for you to memorize that, right? It's just, again, to know the concept. Do a family history. Then what you can do is go to one of these websites, cancer.org, cancer.gov, cdc.gov, uh, slash cancer. All great information that can guide you on what you should be doing to help your family. So... A couple of things about our cancer center. Any questions before I share a little bit of information on our cancer center? No questions? Great. Excellent. So our cancer center, we call it the advanced care center, right? Because we want to have a positive connotation to it or positive sound to it. Um, it's the first and only accredited cancer treatment program, COC cancer uh, treatment program in the, in the Valley. That's important. The COC, what they do is they... They look at our at different cancer centers and they assure that certain standards are met, that we treat certain conditions a certain way, we do certain tests, we do certain follow-ups. So there's standards that are shown to lead to better outcomes. So being part of a COC is awesome. And that's what part of, that's what our center does. We're gonna actually have a survey uh, in a couple months. They're gonna come back and survey us again. They do this every few years um, just to make sure that we keep our game up, okay? Also, even more exciting than that, I think, we received approval to become one of the main members of the SWOG Cancer Research Network. 
And what that is, it's the largest National Cancer Institute clinical trial uh, uh, cooperative, right? Why is that important? We talked about how quickly cancer is, is evolving and advancing, right? We now have the potential to treat patients with the newest medications. And that's what clinical trials are. Before we had to send everybody to Houston, San Antonio, Dallas for cancer treatment programs. We don't have to do that anymore. We are running our own. Dr. Rao and his team have done amazing work to make sure that this happens. What does that mean? That means that we have an opportunity to be, to be on the cutting edge of research. We have always, and I'm pretty sure um, this has been said earlier today, um, we have always been sort of on the outskirts of treatments. Now we can be part of treatment plans, right? Take our genetics into consideration to actually form treatment plans that help us, okay? These are some of our team members. You're gonna find surgeons, you're gonna find radiation oncologists, you're gonna find ear, nose, and throat specialists, hematologists, oncologists, hospice, and palliative care. All very important. And that's all I've got for you today. Any questions? Yes, sir. So you're gonna, it depends on when, where you looked at the data and the year of the data, okay? Um, I believe this data was from 2018. And as you can see, breast cancer affects 124 uh, people out of 100,000 women. Uh, in the United States, it affects 117 out of 100,000 women in Texas, and it affects 106 uh, out of 100,000 people in South Texas. Good question. Any other questions? Well, I hope you guys have a great day. This is an exciting program. I'm glad that this exists. Um, you know, we're here to, to help and mentor you guys if anyone has any uh, aspirations of going into the medical field. Um, you guys have the potential to, to, to really be the difference makers in your family. So um, I'll, make, I'll make contact with the leader of the program. And if you guys have any questions, need to shadow anybody, you guys are always welcome to join me. I'm, I'm at the main hospital, okay? Thank you, everybody.